today I'll be reading James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. Again, that's James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. And it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall in various trials, knowing that the test, testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its per- perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not the man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unseeable in all ways. Thank you, Josiah. It's a good day today. Lots of people around. You get a day off tomorrow, so that makes today a good day. Uh, Always some good things. As we've been talking about our thing about believe and about the different things that happen with that, we talked about what it is, and then we've been talking here recently about how to do those things. How do we express our faith and what is it that we would do and so today we want to talk a little bit about prayer and I think it is one of the most powerful things that we have that we are able to do I mean it's just amazing what God's able to do from this there are so many passages that talk about this so I'm not going to cover all of them today you should have been in class Jimmy covered some But there's so many that you can't even do that. It's just a lot to have to do with this on prayer. But I want to give you just a very basic beginning part about what it talks about here when we start talking about about prayer and about what all that means. And so in the passage that Josiah has read to us, James starts off with saying, I want you to count it as joy when you have trials. Well, that doesn't make sense. Count it as joy when you have trials. Nobody counts it as joy when you have trials unless they see it doing something. Count it as joy when you get to go to work. Well, no, we don't count it as joy when we get to go to work unless it's payday. See? So if it's payday, then we're glad we went to work all those other days. And so it's looking forward past the the initial part of what you have toward the end and so that's what he's saying about prayer he says I want you to count it joy when you count when you come upon various trials because they will make you mature the testing of your faith produces patience or steadfastness let that have its full effect you're going to be complete you're going to be perfect now it doesn't mean you're never going to sin that's not what perfect means here it means you're going to be full grown that that you're going to be able to deal with things that you will be lacking in nothing I like that phrase but I'm not sure I like the way you go about this because that's what he's trying to get across here and so when you start looking at that and start looking at this whole idea of counting it as various trials as a joy I'm not sure we want to think of it that way But that's what he says. Count trials as a joy. And when you can look at trials as a joy, because you're looking toward the end, what God can bring out of it, the way God's able to do it, then it's going to benefit you. Now, if you go into trials and you're not counting them as a joy, you're counting them as a terrible time, it's awful, I'm going to hate this, you won't learn a thing. You won't develop anything. It'll just be there. You'll suffer through it, and you'll hate it. You didn't learn anything. And that's what happens to us sometimes. He's saying here, the way in which you take this, if you're able to look at trials as a joy, then God's able to use that and do something with it. If you encounter trials, and it's not a joy to you whatsoever at all, it's uh, something that's terrible, then it'll just be terrible. And that's what you'll have to put up with. There is a way to win, and God shows us a way to win in all of this. So, school's just out. Some people see a test as coming. It says this is a test when you have trials or a test. Some people uh, see a test as coming as it's the most horrible, awful thing ever. 
I mean, they gave us all this information. They gave us books to read. They stood up there and talked about it. And how dare they think we're going to remember anything, right? I mean, you've already forgotten. You've been out of school two days. So sometimes we look at it that way. However, my dad tried to explain this, but it really didn't come across. I said, oh, I've got a test today. He says, great, you have a chance to make an A. The man was not thinking in reality. <laughs> I had no chance of making an A whatsoever, but I tried not to argue with him. But if you can look at it that way, as here's a chance for me to do something great. I can show those teachers that what they taught me is, is something important. I can say, you know what, I read the book because I know the answers. And everything can be then something that is good to you and you get a blessing from it because you've gotten promoted, you've gotten all of these things that come out of the fact that I learned all of this. And so how we look at different things determines what happens to us. So every day I think we have chances to make an A or chances to fail. And it's all based on how we choose to see it. And sometimes it's pretty hard to, to see it that way. I like this idea of lacking in nothing, though, so that we're able to have these various trials, lacking in nothing. However, when you look at the passage, you can be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing, but any, if, if any of you lacks wisdom. I thought we already solved the lack problem. You know, we're lacking in nothing, and then if you lack wisdom, what does he mean if you lack wisdom? We just got the... He's either saying, you know what, this will give you maturity, but it's not going to give you wisdom. Or he's saying, you're going to get maturity and everything else that comes with it, and here's a subset of this. So if you don't have wisdom, pray about your trial. And that's the way it's going to come. If you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously, and he's able to do something incredible there. It also may come through trial. But what you're really looking for is that joy. That joy that makes the, all the difference in this. If any of you lacks wisdom, God is able to give. And the trials bring maturity. It's a test of faith. He gives generously to everyone. But there are conditions. He says, I don't want you to doubt. I don't want you to be unsure. I don't want you to be an unstable person. It's like a wave. I don't know if you ever thought in Arizona about a wave. Which way do waves go? Toward the beach, right? How do they know? You can't say, go that way, wave. They always come right for your sandcastle that you built and crash it all down. I mean, that's, that's where waves go. But he says it's driven, it's pushed, it has no mind of its own. Do you want to be that kind of person? that's driven and pushed by all the forces around you and you have no mind of your own, but boy, I'm, I'm you know, going somewhere really fast, but I have no clue where. He says, God is able to give this wisdom. God is able to give this. He says, but you can't just be pushed around by everything. You've got to be able to decide, make a stand, make a decision, not being double-minded, not looking both ways, not unstable, where you're able to be secure and know what you're doing. Ask God for wisdom if you don't doubt. You see, if you doubt, then I'm not sure how much of the wisdom you get. I think maybe that's another trial so that you'll learn not to doubt. But that's just the way things kind of work. But he says, ask God for wisdom. Would you like to have wisdom? Everybody say yes. Okay, good. Just making sure you're awake. I'm making sure. Because I just well, didn't want anybody going, no, I'd rather be dumb. I don't, don't want any wisdom whatsoever. But he says, I want you not to doubt at all. So why would a doubtful person pray? If he doesn't think it's going to do any good, if he doesn't think it'll ever happen, if he doesn't think that, you know, well, I don't believe in any of this stuff, I don't think it'll all happen, why would they pray at all? Well, there's a very good reason. It's called the panic prayer. 
And I think that's what happens to us. We get to that prayer time and, you know, we wouldn't normally say anything about waves. Can you make the waves go the other way? But there's that panic time. There's a time when Jesus was out on the sea with his disciples. It says in Mark 4, 35, On that day when evening had came, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with them, and a great storm arose, and the waves were breaking over into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And when they woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear, and they said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So as you look at this, I think we can see the most obvious prayer that we get in anywhere in the world. It's only four letters. Help! That's it. That's the one prayer that people say more than, I'm not sure who they think they're talking to, but it could be just anybody. If it's not in anybody in earshot, then God, help! I want you to be able to rescue me. I want you to be able to do something. And then they've gotten Jesus. He's obviously exhausted. He's out here on the sea, and the sea gets worse and worse. They're traveling across. At least four of them are fishermen. So they understand this. They know how this works. They've been out on the sea before. It's like they're saying, we got this. They took him along with them in the boat, right? So it wasn't Jesus, so let's all get in the boat, and uh, you're on the rudder, and you're on the oars, and you're on the sail, and you're on the... No, no, no. They know how to do this. They've got this. And so he's asleep. I don't know who decided to put in the part about the cushion. You know... uh, you know, is that really an important thing? We're out here straining hard on the oars, and he's got a cushion. So anyway, that's just one of those things that happens, and then the sea gets worse and worse to the point where you start to get the blame. No, it's not the real boat, but you get the idea of what a storm looks like. And then it's the don't you care if we're perishing. So it's already a blame situation. That kind of prayer is offered so many times. That's a doubtful prayer. That's one that says, I don't really think there's anything that can happen, but God, I'm going to blame you for whatever does happen. Don't you care that we're about to die? And I see so many times when people are facing difficult situations, they come to that point where their prayer is more about blaming God than it is asking for help. Because they no longer have any faith. It's God, you would have, you should have done you this, you that, and that's really not what it's all about. I think it's more our normal kind of prayer to have a panic prayer. God, keep us safe on this trip because there's a big truck coming. We accuse God of not caring because it isn't done already. Interesting enough in this, the disciples did get what they wanted, didn't they? I mean, they never said, please calm the storm. They didn't wake him up with that. They woke him up with, don't you care, we're all about to die. And you've got a cushion. You know, that's what he's saying here is, we don't know how to deal with this. It's not exactly the best kind of prayer, but here he is. And Jesus gets up and he stills the storm and he says, why did you doubt? Where is your faith? Your prayer ought to be that. But it isn't. And so, often our prayer is a panic prayer. And that's what you find happening here. When Jesus prayed, he prayed about his ministry. He prayed about his disciples. He prayed before he chose his disciples. He gives a model prayer. We see him spending the night on the mountain praying to God. I imagine talking about what's coming next. We even 
have a glimpse into him on the mountain talking to Moses and Elijah. Prayer seems to be taught. His disciples ask him, teach us to pray. He gives them the model. Here's what I want you to do, not words that I want you to say. And I find it's amazing as you come down in his life to realize that a lot of his life was about prayer. He ought to know more than anybody else what God was going to do. Because after all, he is God. He is that son of God born on earth. He should know what God's going to do. He should know everything about it. If anybody was ever not doubtful, it's, it would be Jesus. And so as Jesus prays, it's not a God give me this, God let me do that. I think more there's something else going on. And I think we've got to learn this deeper side of prayer. And there's a whole bunch more to it, but let me just introduce this today. You realize his last event on earth, the very last thing that he was able to control and that he was able to do was to pray. That was it. So in Matthew chapter 26, in verse 36, they've gone to the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, when Jesus went with them to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And take him with him, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again for the second time he went away and he prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and he prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. And then he came to the disciples and he said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. As Jesus had gone to the garden, he knew they were coming. He had sent Judas out. He knew exactly what was going to happen, and he goes to pray. If you already know what's going to happen, what do you pray? Would you pray, don't let it happen, when you already know it's going to happen? You're at the rendezvous. You're at the place you know Judas is going to bring them so he can catch you. And Jesus goes there to pray. It's very interesting to be able to look at how he does this. Uh, they've been there a lot. That's why Judas knows where it is, because they've been there a lot. We think a lot of times prayer is very solitary. I'm going to go away by myself and pray, and Jesus does that at times. He goes on top of the mountain, sends the others in the boat across. But then a lot of times also, Jesus prays right in front of them, or he brings them along with him in order to pray. And so he says to some of them, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit here while I go pray. And then he picks Peter, James, and John's and says, you guys come with me and takes them closer so that they are able to be there. And he says, now I want you to pray. And he goes a little further where they can hear him. And he starts to pray. He shows Peter, James, and John his emotion. He shows them what he's feeling. He shows, he begins to be distressed. He begins to be troubled. So there's two things I want you to draw out of this that I want you to take away today. The first one is pray for people. Jesus asked them to pray for him. And pray with people. And ask people to pray with you. And so people need to be involved in this because that's what we see Jesus doing here. He takes and divides them up. Some are closer than others. So Peter, James, and John are the ones that he keeps. And he says to them, keep watch with me. Really? Watch for what? 
He didn't say watch for soldiers coming up the hill. Maybe he should have been more specific. But he says keep watch with me. And then something about temptation. I don't want you to fall into temptation. Really? Why is that? Because Jesus takes this time of being personal. He takes this time and he says, I want you to pray with me. Won't God answer Jesus' prayer better than he will Peter's, especially when Peter falls asleep? So it must not be about getting the best answer. It must be about taking somebody with you in order to pray and somebody who is involved in that process with you. He says, I want you to keep watch with me. And his disciples keep falling asleep. So if their prayer isn't effective, that means you don't get what you want. I don't think that's really the point. He takes the ones that are closest to him. And he takes them away to pray. Because this is a very intimate time. Ask people to pray. So do you have people that you pray with? That you call and they come and you sit down and you pray with? Me either. Some of you do. Something that could be a whole lot better in my life and maybe in your life as well because this is what Jesus does. Get people you trust. Get people that care about you. And it isn't about getting the right answer. It's about being able to share the presence of God and about being able to pray together. And sometimes they're just there to keep watch. He says, I want you to keep watch about your temptation. Do you know that they're there for you? You know that you would be there for them. That's always the easiest way, isn't it? If you need me to pray with you, I'll be glad to do that. And if I need you to pray, well, never mind. And that's what we do, isn't it? Somewhere we've got to be able to bridge this so that we're able to do this together. And then he says, I want you to pray about your temptation. Watch and pray that you won't enter into temptation. And so pray about your sin. Pray about, certainly we know about the part that says pray for forgiveness and ask God to forgive you and he will forgive you. But here he says, I want you to pray about your temptation. No, no, we haven't done it yet, God. Don't we have to wait till we've done it before we can start praying about it? And that's not what Jesus is doing here. He says, I want you to pray about your temptation, that you won't enter into temptation. Pray about your sin before it happens. That might be a much better way to approach sin, don't you think? Because Jesus is praying about his temptation. His temptation is, let me run. Why would I stay here? I know they're coming. His temptation is to say, I've got a whole lot of forces I could use to make this not happen. But as your will be done, he could have stopped it, but he won't. See, we tend to pray after it's already happened. Maybe we need to tell a God about our temptation first. Would that help? If we could do that. So what do you think his prayer would be? It's too late to pray, right? He's already got caught. Well, that's when you need to pray is when you get caught. Well, maybe there's a better time to do this. So sometimes it's just not about the, yeah, I've been caught. And then, well, okay, we better pray now. Uh, Depends on who's on the other end of that look, I guess. So maybe it's like this. Not going to pray till I got one out of the bowl. <laughs> because you know what the answer is. Get away from the bowl. But if you start praying before you ever get into the temptation, it will make a huge difference. Because the answer is so simple. Get away from the bowl. That's all you have to do. And if we prayed about it then, but we don't seem to do that very well. 
So I think praying about our temptation, praying we won't enter into temptation because there's soldiers coming up the hill after Jesus and you need to be able to pray about what's going to happen very, very soon. How am I going to react? Am I going to act in faith or am I going to not? And we tend to pray more this way. It looks like such a good hook, doesn't it? Well, this one doesn't even have a worm. Sin, sin is never what it seems. It always takes you where you don't want to go. It promises you more than it can ever deliver. And it costs more than you ever want to pay. It leaves us empty and it never gives us what we thought. It never gives you that. If you knew the hook was under the worm, you wouldn't bite it, would you? You know when Satan brings something or something is wrong, it's a trap. Why would we not know that the hook is under there? He tells us that. He says, I want you to pray to God. I want you to be able to talk to God at all times. And maybe you need to talk about it before when it's still a temptation. So was this a successful time when Jesus and his disciples prayed? I would say yes. But he still went to a cross. Seems like the answer would be no then because they didn't get what they wanted. No, they got what they wanted. And so sometimes our way of thinking about God's answers may not be quite the right thing. We think if God will give us what we want, and we're very specific, you know, give me this and that will make me happy and that will be great and that's what I need, and, and God does something completely different that's much better for us. But that's where we are. They get there to the time and the disciples were with Jesus till the soldiers came, pray, so that you can still do that. A gathering of people that pray is not about getting the right answer. It's about talking to God. Yeah, you can know. Yeah, you can pray for deliverance. Yeah, you can pray to get out. But notice what Jesus told them and what he didn't tell them. He didn't say pray about the soldiers who are coming up the hill. He didn't say pray so that I won't be crucified. He says, I just want you to pray. And you're going to find out what it's like and what comes. And so maybe the fact that they have prayed helped them deal with the situation. So I'd like to encourage you to do two different things with prayer. I want you to pray for others. I want you to be able to pray for their distress. I want you to pray for people that you know, people that you're close to. Ask them to pray with you. And then Jesus still went to a cross. And so pray about your sin. Pray about your temptation. Pray for forgiveness. But maybe pray about your temptation as well. Pray about your dealing with sin because sin is when we find that forgiveness. And when Jesus is able to forgive, his death on a cross completely takes away our sin when we make a covenant with him. That happens, as we know, by baptism. When we're baptized into Christ, then those sins are taken away. So maybe we need to pray about your baptism. Or maybe we just need to do it. There may be a lot of people already who have been praying about your baptism. Maybe you should pray about your own baptism, and your own repentance. Is it time to do something about that? Prayer is so powerful. It can change your life. Find somebody that helps you do that. Would you come while we stand and sing?